Welcome back to Breaking the Cycle of Gang Violence. This is episode six. If you have not checked out the first five episodes, definitely go do that. They are up and live for you to stream right now. We're going to start today by letting Joe introduce us to our first guest. Welcome to episode six. I am pleased to announce the Honorable Judge Robert Tafoya, who is currently assigned to a Kern County Superior Court judge. Uh, his current assignment is in the Delano McFarland area as a criminal and civil. Uh, he was appointed to the bench in 2002 by Governor Davis. Um, he holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Cal State Sacramento, a Master's degree in Education from USC, and received his Juris Doctorate from Hastings College in 1978. And prior to all this, uh, he maintained a, a private family law practice. So Judge, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, also a fellow Trojan, so fight on. I'm glad right. to hear that. <laughs> um, we want to start today by just diving right in and kind of talking to us about what you see as a judge when it comes to gang violence. Well, from my perspective, I see gang violence in a judicial context. Uh, when I am overseeing a criminal calendar, uh, young men... Uh, and women from time to time, but primarily young men, are brought into my courtroom to be arraigned on charges involving gangs, uh, or I oversee jury trials, or I oversee preliminary hearings. And so my interaction with these young men are when they're brought into my courtroom many times in chains and asked to enter pleas. And so that's how I come into contact with these young men. Um, when a complaint is presented to me, I have to read the complaint, read the charges to the defendant. It, prior to the plea, I look at the charges and I look to see if there are gang allegations, that is, was a crime committed, allegedly committed in furtherance of a street gang. I look to see whether the charges are misdemeanor offenses or felony offenses. A misdemeanor offense is a, is a, a crime that carries as a penalty up to one year in the county jail. A felony is a, a classification, a class of crime that can carry time in the county jail or time in state prison. When I look at the complaints, I also look to see whether there have been enhancement allegations alleged in the complaint. So for example, if a person is charged with a robbery and there's a gang enhancement alleged, I look to see if there are other allegations for, for example, during the perpetration of the robbery, great bodily injury uh, uh, enhancements are alleged that the defendant allegedly caused the victim to suffer serious bodily injury. I look to see whether weapons are used, guns, knives, and that gives me an idea of who the young person is that is, uh, that is uh, presenting himself before me. There are times when uh, I appoint counsel and counsel will ask for bail reductions. They'll say, Judge, this young man who's standing before you is young, he's 18, 19 years of age, he has no adult criminal record uh, and he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. There was just some big misunderstanding and we're asking that you set bail below our regular Kern County Superior Court schedule. When that occurs, I ask defense counsel and the prosecution for permission to review the police report. Because as a matter of law, when a case comes before me, I cannot read the police report. That's not my role. Hmm. But if I'm asked to render a decision concerning bail, then I need background information. So if both sides are willing to stipulate to have me read the police report, then I'll glance through it to get an idea what the facts are. But then I'll also go to the rap sheet of the, of the defendant, and that's the uh, uh, recorded uh, uh, documentation regarding past prosecution. I look to sieges, the, the uh, California Judicial Information Te Telecommunications database, and I look to see who this young person is. Do they have a juvenile record? Uh, do they have a, a, a criminal adult record? If so, what are the nature of the charges? 
So he may be 18, but let's say he's been uh, involved in uh, antisocial behavior, let's say, uh, since he was 15. And he's been in and out of uh, juvenile hall, Camp Owens, perhaps even California Youth Authority. So I look at all those different factors for purposes of putting the issue before me in a proper context. And all that information is before me. And uh, I use it to, like I said, to, to put proper context uh, to the issue uh, that I have to decide. So it's interesting because really the first time you're quote unquote meeting some of these people is in this context. Correct. And so then you're looking at just the charges that are in front of you and it's sometimes their history as well. So taking in a person, for lack of a better way to say this, seeing only all of their bad or potentially nothing on their record, what is that like from your perspective, given that this is the first time you're meeting the person? Well, I, I, I need to find out the, the context. Who is this young person who is standing before me? Are we dealing with a young man who was at the wrong place at the wrong time, who in his young life has exhibited behavior that suggests he has some redeeming qualities? Uh, he's a full-time high school student with a grade point average of 3.5. He is involved in uh, extracurricular activities, football, baseball, basketball, he plays music. He may have family in the audience who are there to vouch for him. That is a mother, a father, brothers and sisters, which suggests to me that there is a support system, people who are here to provide support. I look at, 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 uh, at those circumstances. I look to see whether or not this is a crime of violence. I look to see whether weapons were used. Uh, but again, in order to analyze a particular problem, whether it's a legal problem or whether you go to a doctor, when you go to a doctor, they want the history, you know. History of, uh, do, does your family have a history of diabetes? Uh, do you have, uh, 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 have exhibited symptoms consistent with diabetes for how long? Please describe in detail. Well, when I'm analyzing a, a, a legal issue, I need as much information as I can gather given the li limited circumstances, so that I can properly analyze the situation. So if I see that this young man uh, has no criminal record, charges are serious, but I have a family that will vouch for him, then I have to uh, ask the question, how do I best deal with this situation? Part of my concern would be, and I think a Corporal Montreal would, would, would agree, if this young man uh, is on the border, but I decide to set bail in an amount that is so high that he will not be able to bail out, then he remains in custody. When he remains in custody, he's now subject to those influences that, um, that sometimes are very negative. That this kid, maybe we got his attention. He spent the weekend in jail and he's terrified and I can look at body language and see this child is afraid. We've got his attention. But if I decide that he is to remain in custody, am I running the risk that by him being incarcerated and socializing with other bad elements, is that going to compound the problem? Mm. So y y you look at all those different factors and, and I may weigh uh, weigh in by asking the prosecution. Madam Prosecutor, this is what I'm thinking. What are your thoughts? You know. mm -hmm. But in many situations, there are no support uh, members. There, there are no family members in the courtroom to vouch for that child. Maybe a mother. Mm. Rarely do I see a father. And we definitely want to get into that, but I, I want to touch base on something you just said. I think we talked about that with Sergeant Nunez, too, was, you know, making the decision up front, will his instance, was giving a citation really going to be beneficial for this, or is it just educating the person? Right. Yeah, and I think uh, when we talked to Mike Salazar, he stated um, once they're not afraid to go to jail, that's it. It's hard for us to get them back, because if they have that fear of going to jail, 
there's a chance we can get him and bring him back to this side. However, once they, that fear of going to jail is gone, we lost them. We lose that leverage. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that's, and that's very true. I agree with that. How frequently do you think um, you deal with um, cases that have to do with gang violence? Well, I mean, it depends on the charges. I think that the district attorney's office files maybe uh, maybe three to four cases a week in, in Delano, and I arraign them. Uh, and in many instances, uh, there is a disposition between the, the time of the arraignment and uh, the time of the preliminary hearing. There's negotiations, and I'll take the plea, and so I don't get too much into the details. Mm. But uh, I would venture to say uh, three, four times a week, I have to arraign young men uh, who are charged with uh, criminal offenses, misdemeanor, and felonies that involve uh, gang enhancements. Wow. Now, have there been over the years any particular cases that have stood out to you that involved gang violence? I'll give you t- two. One involved three young men who resided in the uh, city of Arvin. And they stole a vehicle, and they drove the vehicle from the city of Arvin to McFarland, and they parked the stolen vehicle in the fields close to Sherwood Avenue. Then, a few days after they stole the vehicle, they drove the vehicle to the Chevron station, which is located on Sherwood and 99, uh, maybe six, seven o'clock in the morning. Two of the three young men got out of the car. One was armed with a firearm. They went into this uh, market and they robbed the clerk, and there happened to be two clerks. They robbed the clerks of, I think, uh, $80 in cash and $200 worth of these lotto scratchers. They then returned to Arvin after the commission of the offense, and being young kids, they're bragging to all their friends, they're, they're d- uh, sharing these scratchers with their, their friends. Within 72 hours, they are uh, arrested, and uh, they are eventually charged with armed robbery. And they're brought before me, and I preside, I'm presiding over the preliminary hearing. And during the examination of one of the officers uh, by the prosecution, I noticed that two of the three defendants began giggling. So I stopped the proceeding and I said, young men, do you have any clue as to what is going on? And then they look up at me and they sort of compose themselves. And I says, do you young men realize that your lives are imploding? They just looked at me as if they were, they were, they were confused. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, tell you what, we're going to stand in recess. And I brought the prosecution, the Madam Prosecutor, and the defense attorneys into my chambers. And so I turned to Madam Prosecutor and says, Counsel, what the, what's going on here? Uh, why can't this case resolve? And she says, Judge, I offered these gentlemen nine years in state prison. Now, you need to understand something. These young men commit a robbery, and this is a felony. And the sentencing triad for a felony, I think, is two, four, six years. This is a first offense. The court will look at the midterm of four years. And now we're talking state prison. We're not talking jail, because this is a violent offense, Mm -hmm. as defined by statute. But they also charged the, the, the defendants with committing a crime in furtherance of a street gang. So that adds 10 years consecutive to the four years. So now we're facing 14 years. Then they, enha- they enhanced the, the charges by alleging use of a firearm. That's another 10 years. They're facing 24 years. We have two clerks. To make a long story short, these young men who are, I don't think they're even able, they're old enough to shave, are facing about 35 years in prison. So Madam Prosecutor says to me, Judge, I offered him nine years on a 35-year exposure. So I turned to defense counsel and I said, gentlemen, what what gives? And they say, Judge, how in the world can you tell an 18-year-old that nine years in state prison is a good deal? 
They don't get it. They have no clue. So they lack the sophistication. They lack the maturity to, tr to, to understand or appreciate the gravity of the situation. Mm -hmm. They may figure it out 10 years down the road, but by that time it's way too late. Right. So that's one example. I have a quick question on that one. So sure. even though only one had a firearm, were all three facing the same? Absolutely. Because the, 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 the allegation uh, uh, and the argument to the jury will be that they were aiding and abetting. It was, it was a, uh, a conspiracy among the three of them to commit the crime. Got it. So okay. even though one is carrying a firearm and he enters the structure, that individual who was city, seated in the car is going to be held to the same uh, criminal exposure. Now, during negotiations, maybe defense counsel can argue for a different disposition if he's willing to cooperate, things sure. of that nature. But yes, that's, that's yeah. the reality. And that's important for parents and kids to know that just because you're not the one with the firearm doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to you if you're still a part of it. Well, yeah, yeah. something that, that, that needs to be said. I, I am a superior court judge, and when I was appointed to the bench in 2002, I had to take an oath to uphold the laws of the state of California, to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the state of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Penal Code Section 186.21 sets forth the policy regarding gang prosecution. The state, state legislature has, has made a finding, as a matter of fact, that the state of California is in a crisis as a result of st street gangs. And it is the intention of the state legislature to eradicate this problem by any means necessary within the confines of the law. So when a person is charged with an offense that includes allegations of the commission of a crime and furtherance of, of, of a street gang, that person is facing a, a very serious consequence, which is in the example that I gave you. Mm -hmm. So it was not just the robbery, it was the rob robbery with the gang, with gang enhancement that automatically added 10 years mm -hmm. to, to the offense. And it's important that if a young person chooses to participate in street gangs, it carries consequences, big consequences. Another example, a young boy and his sister and cousin are walking down, I think it's uh, uh, High Street, and the boy has a bicycle. And he's walking uh, down the street going home. A car drives by, two boys jump out of the car. They walk up to the boy and the two girls, and one grabs the bike, pushes the young boy who was uh, controlling the bicycle, and told him the bike is ours. They open up the trunk and they put the bike into the trunk, and as they're leaving, they turn to the boy and they say, just remember, Delano Southside. The moment that statement was made, that triggers a gang enhancement. So here you have robbery, uh, taking personal property from the person of another by force, two, four, six years. So it's midterm, four years, first offense. Then you add 10 years consecutive. So it's 14 years that those two defendants are facing for stealing a bicycle. Wow. In my day, if that would happen, they'd call your dad, dad pulls out the belt, <laughs> and they handle it that way. <laughs> now, it's mm -hmm. 14 years state prison. Wow. It's a different world. Yeah. It is a different world, and it's important that young folk uh, appreciate that uh, the law is very clear. If you want to engage in uh, street gangs, participate in street gangs, uh, those choices will carry very serious adverse consequences. Have you dealt with repeat offenders? Do you see people in your courtroom more than once for a different uh, charge, more things that are happening? Oh, yes. All what, the time. What is that like? What do you mean? What is it like? Is it, is, it, is it frustrating for you to feel like you only have so, so much, um, power's not the right word, but there's only so much you can do from your specific position? Well, right. I'm a judge. I'm not a social worker. That's not my role. Now, I can appreciate 
the, the, the social implications, I can understand and appreciate uh, the harm caused to the uh, family members of that defendant. But if the person chooses to engage in that behavior on a consistent basis, there's, there are going to be consequences. And I judge people by what they do as opposed to what they say. And so if a person chooses to engage in this behavior time and time again, and that person has been given ample opportunity to change, and he or she chooses not to, then they have to accept the consequences. So, uh, no, I, I don't become frustrated in that sense that, that I'm angry at this individual. I'm not there to pass moral judgment. This is a court of law. I'm dealing with legal principles, and I'm dealing with evidence, I'm dealing with facts. And so, uh, again, if a person appears before me, there's a presumption that he is innocent or that she is innocent. I look to the evidence. And so uh, I'll, let the, I'll follow the evidence. That's, that's how it works. And over so many years that you've been a judge, have you seen any patterns or themes emerge when it comes to gang violence and what you see in the courtroom? Um, I mean, I just see... It's, it's interesting. I, I, I see a progression, uh, and it starts with young people. Uh, when I have to send a young boy, and to me they're boys, uh, who's just turned 18, to state prison for 10 years, the question I always ask is, where was the father? Where was the father that brought this child into the world? Now, I also handle what we call our Division C calendar. And the Division C calendar involves defendants who committed crimes inside of the state prisons. Kern Valley State Prison, North Kern State Prison, Tehachapi, Corcoran, San Quentin. When these persons appear before me, one of the dominant character characteristics that, that I note with these men is how hardened they are, how cold they are, how they've lost that sense of humanity, as opposed to a young little 18-year-old who really doesn't have a clue. So from that standpoint, it, 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 it's somewhat disconcerting, uh, but that is the nature of the problem. That's how it manifests, and I see it. That's why I'm such a strong believer in prevention. Keep the, these young boys out of my courtroom, because once they end up being sentenced to a California state penal institution, I'd say for the most part, we've lost it. Mm. I want to go back, because you said you brought up specifically fathers of young men. So why is it specifically fathers that you have questions about where are they? Let me answer it this way. If you have a father at home on a full-time basis who interacts daily with his sons and daughters, the chances of that young boy committing a crime of violence are, are very small just looking at the numbers. A young boy who's brought into the world without a father, without guidance, that's where the risk of gang participation takes place. The role of the father is critical. Fathers are responsible for three things. One, they must provide for their families. We work, we get a paycheck, we take the paycheck home, perhaps give it to the missus. We make sure the rent is paid, there's food on the table, the children are clothed, that the basics are met. That's what fathers do. Number two, fathers um, are also responsible for protecting the family. They provide guidance to the family. If they see people uh, dealing drugs out in the front yard, they call the police, they talk to the children, they run the kids off. They provide protection. And three, fathers are responsible for transmitting culture. Fathers are the gatekeepers 
that introduce the boys to the community of men. That's what fathers are supposed to do. They are the ones who teach the boys uh, how to interact with society. For example, if a boy comes into my courtroom with his father, and I notice that the boy's shirt is tucked in, that tells me the father's in control. If a young person comes into my courtroom, shirt untucked, pants down below their hips, no father around, from that I infer a lack of a father's presence. But fathers are, are, are critical to providing guidance. If you remember Mike Salazar's episode one, he said, I didn't have a role model. I didn't have someone whose behavior I could emulate. I didn't know. And the problem is, is that when a young boy does not have a father to guide him, to nurture him, to teach him, two things can happen. One, the child is angry, there's rage, and that rage will be directed towards the mother or towards women. Or that young boy will manifest his masculinity, his manhood, in an aggressive fashion. I'm gonna to be tougher, I'm not gonna cry, I'm going to beat up people. I'm going to gain respect through violence. And it's a hyper-masculine type uh, trait that is, that is misguided and unhealthy. Un understand, when children are born, they bond with their mothers. And as is the case, when, children reaches the, when, when boys reach the age of 12, 13, they have to break away because they begin to think abstractly at the subconscious level that, hey, someday I'm going to grow up and have my own family, my own house, my own job, my own career. So once that realization is, 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 is manifested, they begin to break away. And so they need to break away from the mother and, and, and join the community of men. The father has to be there. The father has to be there to provide that guidance. And when the, child, when the father is not there, there are problems. But not only for the boys, but also for the girls. Mm -hmm. It is the father who teaches the little girls romantic love, not the mother. And it's the little girls who, who are, are, are desperate for the, for the love and the affection and the reaffirmation from their fathers. So when a father is, not, is absent from a little girl's life, the little girl turns to herself and says, what's wrong with me? I'm not, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough that my own father will have no contact with me. So when they reach the age of puberty, 14, 15 years of age, and some little boy comes along and says, you're beautiful, I love you. I mean, they, they, they just, it, it, it reverberates with these little girls. And then the little boy says, and if you love me, you're gonna show me you love me. Take your clothes off. Mm -hmm. And then they're in my courtroom in family law on paternity actions. Fathers need to be there for both the boys and the girls to help them make that transition from, from infancy and uh, uh, into uh, adolescence. And it's the father that transmits culture. We do know that there are, though, a lot of single mothers who do raise great young men. So what do you think is done differently in those circumstances? Maybe the father's passed or the father just hasn't been a part of their life. How is it that those women are able to raise great young men? Well, again, I need more evidence. I mean, every situation requires an independent analysis. I can't give you a general statement. This is, this is how it works. Mm -hmm. I admire those women uh, for doing what they've done, but I'm not in a position to say this is, this is why it, it happens. Every situation is, partic it, it, it is different. And, and so uh, I, I'm not in a position to, to tell you why they're successful. I, I admire those women for raising boys by themselves. Uh, but uh, there are other forces at play. Like, for example, using Mike Salazar. He was raised by a mother, but again, he, as he indicated, the, the, the draw of the streets are quite strong. And so when he was 12 and 13, he began to experiment. And he said first with glue, and then with marijuana, and then with alcohol, and then with all kinds of pills that whatever they were, he was taking them, and then methamphetamine and then heroin, and was there anybody in his life to check him, to challenge him, to work with him, to guide him? No. In, a, in another situation, you may have uncles who are present, other positive role models 
next door neighbors, coaches like Sergeant Mario Nunez, who's taken an interest in this young man, say, you know what, come on, son. Come on with me, I'm going to take you to a Dodger game. Son, I'm going to take you to a different life. So every circumstance requires their own independent analysis, and there is no one simplistic answer that will uh, answer that question. Um, I also want to turn to, we talked to Sergeant Nunez about this as well, but dealing with things that are so um, violent, really, and reading reports at certain times and hearing the stories and things like that, how do you deal with that on a human level? Are you able to separate that, or how do you process it when you go home at night? I'm a judge. It's not my place to take things personally. My job is to look at the evidence whatever that evidence may be, look at the facts and render a reasoned decision. It's not my place to be judgmental. Uh, is it sad what I see sometimes? Sure. Not only in the criminal uh, courts, but also in family law courts. It's a heartbreak. Uh, but uh, that is the nature of, of my work. But it's not my place to personalize it and and be angry and upset by doing so, by allowing my emotions uh, to, to uh, influence my judgment will compromise the quality of the decisions that I make. So I, I, I don't take it personally. Uh, that's, that's not what judges do. Mm -hmm. But do I recognize the, the gravity of the situation? Of course I do. I, I, I'm constantly reading and studying issues uh, related to community and, and gangs and children and development. That's what I need to keep myself informed, to keep my opinions informed and my decisions informed. So I'm constantly studying and reading. Uh, but do I personalize it to the point where it affects my ability to make a rational reasoned decision? No, at least I try not to. Mm -hmm. I want to, you've already touched on a few different ways to do this, but what needs to change in order to keep people out of your courtroom, to keep people from the system? All right. First off, you need to recognize that this is a multifaceted problem. There is no silver bullet that we can utilize to resolve the problem. But let me, let me use this as a, as a, as a metaphor. Black Elk was a chief of the Sioux Nation, and he's quoted as saying that the inner nature of man is identical to the nature of the universe. Let me repeat that. The inner nature of man is identical to the nature of the universe. That we humans have certain characteristics. When you look at life, starting at the, at the uh, micro level, you have atoms turn to molecules, molecules become cells, cells become tissues, tissues become organs, organs become plants, insects, trees, humans, animals. Those are biological living organisms. The cell is the smallest living organism. And living organisms have certain characteristics. They grow, they need energy, they have rules and regulations, and they reproduce. So that's, that's all of us. That's a description of the biological world. And we as humans are subject to the rules of biology. But we humans are also social animals. And we operate within a social context. And the smallest unit within the society is the family. Mother, father, son, daughter. But we humans organize in social context. Channel 23 is a social organism. The Delano Police Department. Is a, social, uh, is a social organism. The courts are social organisms. Schools are social organisms, families. So are street gangs. Street gangs have rules. They need energy, money. Uh, they grow and they reproduce. So the question is, how do we stop the growth? Well, from a biological standpoint, using COVID-19 as an example. We have biochemists right now who are working to find a protein, an enzyme, that they can inject into the virus, hoping that that particular protein or enzyme will prevent the molecules that make up the virus from bonding, from coalescing. And if that's successful, the virus won't reproduce. At the street level, where do gangs, where, where are they created? Where do they form? And one clear-cut example to me is at the middle schools. 
junior high, elementary schools. How do we know? Talk to Mike Salazar. Look at episode number one. You talk to the officers. It starts there. So we, as a, as a community, need to inject an enzyme <laughs> into that process at that level to prevent the, co the, the coalescing of those little molecules, the little cells, okay? And that's where we need to intervene. That's, that's one example. We need to intervene at, at that level. How, so, do, how do we do that, though? Is it on the schools? Is it on the parents? Well, is it on the resource well, well, officers? No, no, no. Uh, using this example, too, there has to be a collaboration between the Delano Police Department and the school districts. Because you need the school districts on board. Mm -hmm. So you need to, in my humble opinion, have a, a we'd call them uh, a school resource officer, or I'd say a, a school uh, character development officer, male, female, depending on the circumstances, at, at all the middle schools. Now, you need to go to the school district and say, we'd like for you to fund the position. And they'll say, we love the idea, but we don't have the money. So that becomes a problem. So that begs the question, well, where does the money come from? And again, this is how I would analyze it. Number one, I don't care what the problem is, there's never enough uh, resources uh, to meet a demand. And you're always going to find uh, that the resources are limited in relation to, to, to the demand. So where does the money come from? Well, first off, policymakers and us adults, we need to decide. Do you want to invest money to build a child or do you want to invest the money to fix a broken adult? One or the other. My preference is to invest the money at the front end through prevention. I can tell you, the last 18 and a half years, I can't tell you the number of people that I have sent to drug, drug programs, our PC-1000 drug diversion programs, Prop 36 diversion programs, and I can tell you, they're failures. They're flat out failures. I was a lawyer for 24 years. I ran a business, and I would challenge uh, our, our policymakers to contract researchers to conduct just a quantitative analysis of the effectiveness of drug programs. And let's say we define success as being those persons who were enrolled in a program and after one year successfully complete the program and are drug free for 36 months following the graduation. And I would venture to say that we would be lucky if one out of 10 succeeded. And that's based on an, an, uh, anecdotal evidence, based on what I see. Mm -hmm. um, but we can, we can document that. That's pretty easy to do to quantify it. And if, and if my assessment is correct, then that begs the question, perhaps maybe we should use that money for drug programs and reinvest that at the front end to finance school resource officers. Remember Mike Salazar, episode number one. He told us, I was a criminal, and I committed all kinds of crime, I think starting from the, the Melissa's mischief to, uh, to uh, robbing a, a cab driver. He, he, went, he, he ended up going to California Youth Authority State Prison and became a heroin addict. And it wasn't until these two women came to visit him when he was in ADSEG, and they said, Jesus loves you, and Jesus sent us to reach you. It was at that point, and only at that point, that he, that he decided, that's it. I want a different life. And I've come to the conclusion that a person is not going to beat the addiction until he or she says, that's it. I don't want this anymore. And until that occurs, then they'll go through this illusion. And it is an illusion in the sense that we as a society think, okay, we're going we're gonna to release these, uh, these uh, young men from, from prison as for low offender crimes. And we're going to send them to drug programs. And as long as they complete the drug program, we've solved the problem. Well, that's an illusion because it doesn't happen because they're not completing the programs. And to me, it's not a non-violent offense because those men who come into my court with five, six, seven, eight pending drug cases for possession of methamphetamine also happen to be fathers. And they happen to have boys and girls who they're not raising. They're not supporting. Those children are living in poverty because this person has chosen or is addicted to drugs. So what I'm saying is, given the fact that the resources are always limited, never, there's never sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient resource to meet the demand, my position is we invest at the front end. 
and re reallocate those funds for prevention for things like school officers, boys and girls clubs like uh, Yolanda Chacon talked about, about the cultural centers, uh, about providing opportunities for children uh, so to, to expose them while in their formative years so that they perhaps can make a choice that they want something different because now they see, ah. I was a mentor for many years and I remember bringing boys from East Bakersfield into my home. They'd never been to Southwest Bakersfield, let alone sitting down at my kitchen table with my wife and my children, eating dinner. That was a totally foreign experience to them. They'd never had something as simple as that. I remember taking kids to Los Angeles, and we, I remember these are teenagers, and as we were going over the grapevine and they saw Pyramid Lake, they asked if that was the Pacific Ocean. These are teenagers. Wow. They'd never left East uh, Bakersfield. So when I ended up taking them to Santa Monica and to the promenade and to the beach, <laughs> you know, the expression on their face was, you know, spoke volumes about, uh, you know, the exposure. We need to take children, show them. I said, look, this, there is a world out there for you. It, you're not limited to what, what you've seen, but this is what you need to do. We need elders uh, working with the youth in prevention programs, plain and simple. Would you agree that uh, education of parents is, is important too? Because uh, we had Stephanie Fierro's um, week three, and while her son was coming up and evolving into being a gang member, she missed the signs. She didn't know, okay, he's sagging his pants, but that's just the style. Or now he's drawing graffiti. It's art. Um, is it important to you for parents to get the education to they, so they know what to look for when their child is coming up? Well, 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 two things. And again, and I use Mike Salazar as an example because he made it very clear. He says, yeah, I had a mom at home. It, even if she did care, she couldn't stop me. These are boys, okay? And so, yes, it's important that, that parents see and recognize the signs that indicate that perhaps the, ch the boys are involved. But then where does she go? Suppose the boy is 14, 15, six foot two, 190 pounds, all muscle, and the child is aggressive and the child is angry. Well, then what? So mother can identify the characteristics. Then what is she supposed to do? What resources are available to her? And that's where the community comes into play. What do we offer her? And that's why, for example, the notion of the boys and the girls club. That's why Mario Nunez to me is a hero for the work that he does getting that child says, you know what, son, come on. I'm going to go take you to, uh, to, to participate in football. You're going to become a linebacker. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take you to an L.A. Rams game. And then we're going to take him to the different neighborhoods. And he's going to look around and he's going to see, yeah, there's another world. Oh, in fact, I've done this. And I drove the kids to UCLA campus, USC campus. And they go, oh, you see all these young people going into pizza parlors with books. And I said, yeah, that's what students do. It's fun. So it's it's it's... Yeah, parents need to be made aware, but then what do they do with that information? And that's why, again, the whole notion that it takes a village uh, to raise a child, it takes a village to address this issue because the problem is multifaceted and it manifests in so many different ways. So the example I gave is just the immediate, the collaboration between school districts and law enforcement. School districts need the money. We go to the policymakers, hey, reallocate the funds. We say, we want every law enforcement agency to have uh, to use two uh, to to open up a Pell program, a police activities league. If they're not willing to do that, then take two percent of the operating budgets, reallocate it for a a North Kern recreation uh, uh, district, and we use that month those funds for programs geared towards uh, youth development, character development. Uh, teaching them to play chess, allowing them to go swimming, te teaching them the arts, uh, in involving them in, in whatever their interests are. But that's where the money, the resources should be allocated. So it's either at the front end, helping children to become wholesome, well-balanced, loving children, or fixing a broken adult. And the numbers do not support investing that kind of money. And all you do is a quantitative study, and I would venture to say, the data would clearly support my position. I have one final question because we're almost out of time, but sure. how do we break the cycle of gang violence, in your opinion? You've touched on a lot of different ways, but oh. how would you like people to, what would you like people to take away? All right, 
I'll answer it this way. Again, the question belies a lack of appreciation for the multiple dimensions of crime. There is no one solution. But if you're asking me as a judge, I will answer it this way. As a family law lawyer, as a lawyer for 24 years and a judge for 18, I see a strong correlation between poverty, teen pregnancy, high school dropouts, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, crimes of violence, and the absence of the father from the home. Going forward, as I leave the bench and I transition to my next stage, my focus of attention is going to be on working with men. Men need to be men in the total sense of that word. Men of integrity, men of compassion. We need to abandon this divorce culture. We need to focus on marriages. I wanted to help men become good husbands and to become good fathers. Before we get an economic reform, job placement pro program, welfare reform, it's fatherhood. We need the fathers in the home day to day. This whole notion of having sex without responsibility and having a father trying to be a father to a boy every other weekend from Friday at 5 to Sunday at 5 does not get it. And so all these young men who think, well, being a man means, you know, having children from different women, no. It means being at home, being a good husband, being a good father, fighting the good fight, supporting, putting the family first. That, to me, is critical. And I'm, I'm convinced that if we can have more fathers at home committed to their families, committed to their marriage, then a lot of these problems can be resolved. But it starts at home. That's the, that's the smallest unit of the social organism. And that's where we have to start at the social cellular level. That, that's, where it works. that's where it starts. That's my answer in two minutes. Perfect, thank you, Judge. All right, uh, this was episode six of Breaking the Cycle of Gang Violence. Um, I'm Corporal Madrigal, joined with host uh, Jessica Harrington and our guest today, Judge Robert Tafoya. We hope to see you next week for episode seven.